Welcome everyone. We'll start the presentation shortly. We're just giving everyone time to join and we're going to test audio. Sylvain, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Steve, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Good morning. Good morning, thank you. Okay. A couple of seconds to join and we'll get started. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you for joining us for Reliable Ultra Cold Storage Chambers Path to Speedy Temperature Recovery from Door Openings. I'm Amy Washko, your event moderator and marketing leader for Train Technologies Life Science Solutions Business Farrar. All attendees have been placed in listen only mode. This presentation will be recorded and is best viewed using the GoToWebinar software for PC or Mac or by using the GoToWebinar app on our smartphone or tablet. If you have technical difficulties, please send a message in the chat window and we will attempt to troubleshoot your issue. During this presentation, you will have the opportunity to ask our subject matter experts questions using the question window and go to webinar. And once the presentation has concluded, our speakers will be answering your questions live in a session. But first, let me share a little background on our presenters today. Four decades of employment in the pharma industry delivers a diverse experience base. Steve Miller's focus has been on biotechnology processes beginning with the first licensed biotech product, human insulin, to large scale MAB cell culture plants in the US and Ireland, vaccine production and cell therapy facility design. His current consultancy provides engineering services to pharmaceutical clients with a focus on design and project execution of biotechnology drug substance manufacturing facilities and allows for evaluation and planning for technology improvements using and including single use equipment options, cold storage options, and continuous processing. Steve is the owner of CRC Miller LLC. Sylvain Riendo serves as Ferrar's VP of Business Development. He began his career in the early 80s, focusing on the specialized refrigeration application with Carmichael Engineering in Canada. In 1988, Sylvain relocated to the US and continued his career with Forma Thermo, where he was responsible for international distributors in Europe and APAC as a Cascade Services Training Specialist and then Business Development Manager. Later, Sylvain founded and led Elpro Services based in Switzerland. I'm turning it over to Sylvain to begin our presentation. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. And thank you again for the privilege of your time today. So let's get started with the agenda. Next slide, please. So um, you'll see on the agenda, there's a couple of different areas that we're gonna be focusing on. One will be application. And uh, this is where we'll be sharing existing practices for freezing and long-term storage of bulk product using low temperature freezers. Steve will then share industry related experience in here in just a few minutes. In the um, agenda slide also, we will have the, cha the challenges. So this is where we take a closer look at the current ultra cold storage equipment. And again, the limitation of cold wall versus forced air convection cooling. Then we'll get into the capabilities. Surprisingly, the numbers tell the, the, numbers tell the story here because this is where we take a closer look at the required energy to freeze bulk product. Uh, we will then share data specific on how much heat or energy can be removed using a cold wall versus a forced air convection freezer. And we get into updates and we will provide an overview of how forced air um, and an ultra cold equipment is a better way to transfer the energy or heat from the product within the chamber. And then we end up with the uh, finding conclusion in our questions and answers. So next we'll go ahead and it's time to take a quick quiz for you guys, for everyone here that's joining us to take a quiz. And it's a poll. Um, and this is where we're gonna ask you a couple questions. So if you wouldn't mind, start completing the questionnaires. So this is, we're gonna be covering the temperature recovery, 
And for some of us, temperature recovery is a concern, especially when you're dealing with uh, a minus 80. Then we have energy efficiency. Uh, some of you might think that the efficiency of a freezer also part of the technology, right? I mean, it's important to have a, an efficient system. Uh, for some, it might be price point. This is where sometimes it gets a little challenging, right? We're trying to compare cold wall freezers to different technologies and all of a sudden the price point really uh, it goes several X, I'm gonna say. Then we get into scalability. This is where you know, it's you can plan on ULT freezers or you can plan on a large walk-in chambers, but then there's also different solutions and we're gonna be talking about those today. And for some of you, it may be footprint, uh, unit size, right? So we know that footprint is premium for all customers and it comes at a high cost. So the less footprint we use, the better. So we'll go ahead and, um, and jump into that here as soon as we get the results. So that should be here shortly. And, and then so interestingly enough, we see that the temperature recovery is one of the main driver for you, for, for most of you. And energy efficiency is another one, price point and scalability, I guess, fall last. And then footprint size comes in last. So um, obviously the temperature recovery is a main concern for all of you and, and rightfully so, right? Because when we put warm, warm product or we do our door openings, we need to make sure that the temperature recovers. So great. So next slide, please. Um, in, in this slide, we're just gonna go over quickly on the organization overview. So most of you may know train technology as solution providers of chillers and HVAC equipment, but as you can see, train is much more than just chillers and HVAC equipment from commercial equipment to residential. Then you also see in the, um, the transport refrigeration, which is thermal king, which is part of train, and also what we call the, lastly, the life science solution on the far right. So for our scientific was acquired by train technologies in October of 2021. It is now known as Farrar. And uh, as you can see, there are several product brands listed at the bottom of the slide, and those fall obviously under train technologies. Next slide, please. So on the next slide, um, this is where we go, what we, you know, again, the overview of the company. So I just want to take a brief moment to go over train technology solution. As you can see, train technology plays a major role as a solution provider for research, biorepository, uh, bioprocessing and logistics. Our cold uh, solution range from minus 80 forced air bulk to control, uh, to control tall freeze equipment and solutions. And we also have large walk-in or drive-in and those are available from two to eight to minus 40 as, as part of our overall product offering. Then we get into the cold chain solution via the transport and refrigerated truck so as you can see, the uh, Thermo King product is the what we call the last mile solution, such as the Thermo King minus 70 super freezer to uh, even the last mile delivery, which we call the cold cube, uh, which, are, which those are passive product. I will now turn it over to Steve and he will take over the next slide. Thank you, Sylvain. Um, so on this slide, are the various life sciences market segments that use low temperature storage. And you can see the applications for ultra low temperature storage are diverse. From manufacturing storage of samples, raw materials, intermediate and final products, to the exciting newer technology of cell and gene therapy. And each has its own requirements such as specific temperature ranges, temperature uniformity, regulatory compliance, and in all cases, temperature recovery is an important piece. We'll take a closer look at temperature recovery in a few minutes. Next slide. So what is scientific about minus 80? This is an interesting question, and many of you may already know the answer, but generally speaking, minus 80 freezers were created to replace dry ice. This is one of several common industry practices that is based on history 
and not necessarily science. But prior to freezers, samples were stored in dry ice. However, since dry ice evaporates, this requires periodic manual loading of replenished dry ice. This is where minus 80 ULT freezers became popular. Now, keep in mind the main purpose of a ULT freezer is to maintain minus 80 and not to freeze warm product from ambient. Okay, we can all agree a minus 80 ULT freezer can freeze a few two mil vials to minus 80, but the ULT freezers were mainly engineered and designed to hold that minus 80 storage temperature. So the total amount of energy removal of a ULT freezer is limited and Sylvain will go into details in just a few minutes. Next slide. Back to Sylvain. Great, thank you, Steve. So in this slide, so I feel confident saying most of you um, have or are currently using coal wall minus 80 degrees C freezers, uh, such as the one depicted on this slide. And again, they're meant for long-term storage. Uh, the cold wall freezers range from, as you know, from 18 to 33 cubic foot. I believe that would be 600 liter to roughly about 900 liter of uh, reach in for storage of small samples, just like uh, Steve just mentioned. But they can also accommodate a few large containers um, of frozen material. However, the challenge is that, that the overall internal temperature uniformity on cold wall, because again, I mean, there's no circulation of air, could vary greatly. I mean, we're talking from plus nine to plus 14 degrees C uh, from a temperature mapping. And the temperature recovery from door opening, uh, you know, is challenging also because it takes slightly longer. So we'll go over that in just a few minutes. Next slide, please. So on this slide, we're going to go into the weeds and what we call like, okay, so where are we when we start calculating heat load? So the following calculations were made from a, uh, you know, a 700 or a 700 liter or 25 cubic foot ULT freezer. And this is where, you know, you see at the top where we take in consideration the outside convection plus the in cabinet insulation plus the in uh, inside convection in order to get the minus 80. So, th th you know, this is where the, sol the insulation is assumed to be equivalent to roughly about five inches. But here in the last, I'm going to say, well, in the last uh, 15 years, many manufacturers go into what we call VIP, vacuum insulated panel. And the beauty of that is then we don't need to go into a five inch wall thickness. So the base of the cabinet includes the, uh, includes the sides back and the bottom. So this is where we call the, uh, the area, uh, if you see in the middle of the slide, which is roughly equivalent to 6.3 meter uh, square. So the same calculation applies across the face and the door and the door gasket. The only changes is the surface area. So if you look at the bottom, uh, when we start looking at, you know, the heat leak into a ULT freezer, we get into the, what we call the across the door gasket. And this is equivalent to 24 watt. So, but however, this does not take in, consider, in consideration a door gasket heater, nor does it take into the account of a problem with uh, a, a leaky door seal. So that could be due to ice buildup. So those two phenomena could drastically increase the heat transfer to the cabinet from 150 158 watts to something much larger and then causing the freezer refrigeration system uh, to work much harder and longer than it was designed for. Next slide, please. So, when we look again at the ULT freezer, the cold wall minus 80 freezers are designed to maintain cabinet temperature, assuming the heat load comes from the leaks through the insulation, the door and the door gasket, just like we went over a few seconds ago, and the recoveries from door opening. So in order to design uh, for the added cooling capacity, typically a buffer of 25 to 35% is added to the cooling capacity of the refrigeration system. So in this case, taking the 158 watts of, uh, that was listed on the previous slide and then adding 25 to 35 increases the yield to 210 to 240 watts of cooling capacity available. Well, this 
is relatively small number between 52 and 85, and sometimes referred as the reserve capacity, which drives the door recovery time and time to freeze as you are placing a warm product inside the freezer, right? So if you take the the uh, the number that was listed before 158 less the 243, that's where you end up with the 85 and the 52. Next slide, please. So when we look at the current, again, the current capability, this is on the previous slide, sorry, uh, we're having some technical difficulty, but on this slide here, you see what, what's called a ULC, which is an ultra low freezer. Um, and again, so and this, what we call a forced air convection refrigeration design, and it's a region. So let's focus on the heat load and the ability to remove the energy. Now, keep in mind, this is a forced air convection refrigeration design, and it has the capacity of approximately uh, eight ULT freezers. So the storage capacity inside is 190 cubic foot. So if you recall, 158 watts that was estimated for the total heat coming into the minus 80 freezer on the prior slide. Uh, as the forced air convection freezer, you must also take in consideration where you see at the top where we talk about the blower. Well, just the blower motor itself because it's a motor, right? So we're adding heat inside the chamber. So it equates to roughly about 325 watts. And then uh, bringing the total heat load to, sorry, bringing the total heat load to 483 watts with one refrigeration system operating. If you look on the slide on the right hand side, you see two refrigeration system, system A, system B. And this is why I'm mentioning uh, with uh, 483 watts with one refrigeration system operating. So, you know, having the second one operating would roughly bring it to 808 watts. Uh, now keep in mind, we added the fan energy to the second system, right? So that's why we have 808 watts. So each of the two, air convection refrigeration system is designed to remove 1200 watts from the space. So thus the reverse capacity, sorry, the, revert, the reserve, reserve capacity is two times of 120 watts minus 808 watts. So that's equal to 1,592 watts. And I apologize, I have 1,545 listed here, but uh, so that's the system, right? So when you take the total reserve energy capable from this ULC, that's approximately 1800% over a standard ULT freezer. And again, that's both with both refrigeration system running. So again, keep in mind 435 watt remain as a buffer with one refrigeration system running, which gives you a, what we call a free refrigeration capacity increased to over 500% over a ULT freezer. Next slide, please. So on the next slide, we're look we're you know looking into a ULT freezer design, right? So uh, so far we value, we evaluated the ability of the refrigeration system to eject or reject the energy it receives, which is the second half of the issue. Now let's take a look at the mechanism to get the energy to the refrigeration system, and this is where we call the first or the other half of the issue that's generally ignored. So um, so here you go. On number one, and that's depicted with the red circle, you see that we move the energy from the product to the exterior surface of the container. And then two, we call it the natural convection, moves the energy from the con container to the surrounding air. And then three in the green circle, this is where the random motion or diffusion and buoyancy moves the energy across the space. And then four is the natural convection of the cold wall, which moves the energy into the refrigeration system. So this is how a ULT freezer is designed to move the energy. Next slide, please. So on the, uh, similar to the previous slide, you know, once again, we evaluate the ability of the refrigeration system to reject the energy that it receives, again, from the second half. Now let's look at the me mechanism. Again, this is the, first thing or the one that's the, the the one issue that's often ignored and as you can see here number one still the same thing where we have the energy moving from the product to the exterior number two is this is where it differs right so we have forced air which is the blower motor uh, that moves the energy across the container and then three in the blue circle um, this is where the circulation moves the energy to the evaporator coil which is at the top 
And then four is where we force the energy from the coil to the larger surface. So also know that the forced air combustion system that, that that's displayed here is 500 CFM per refrigeration system. So in this drawing, we only show one refrigeration system, but if both refrigeration system are operational, it's approximately a thousand CFM. And this is where it's in key. This is key for the system, right? Especially during pull down to go from minus 80 to minus, uh, sorry, from plus 20 to minus 80, or during temperature recovery from a door opening. Because now we're able to move the energy much quicker because it's convection cooling. So as a comparison, the Ferrar minus 80 ULC freezer uh, is similar to your home, air, your home central air conditioning system. So whereas, you know, you draw the air through the return air vent and in your home, then the air is drawn through the evaporator coil from your air conditioning system, and then the energy is transferred and then cold air comes out of the vents within your house. Next slide, please. So how much energy is there and how much, how fast can we remove it? So in the past webinar, because we can't, due to time, we can't really go into the, the details too much uh, because of time constraints, but in the past seminar, or webinar, sorry, we mentioned that the energy to remove a single carboy, which is the 10 liter carboy, which is on the right hand side, it's an, filled to eight liter, roughly takes about 4.7 million joules of energy. And this is where we need to calculate the, the rate of the heat transfer when the liquid first reaches zero degrees C, right? Because this is where we go into the phase change, right? From, from, uh, from liquid to solid. So using forced air or dynamic, or dynamic cooling, triples the co coefficient of the heat transfer. And again, this is a representation of how hard the refrigeration system must work to remove the heat from the carboy. Just like, again, you would feel cooler uh, when you're in the wind or, in, or having a fan blowing on you uh, versus just sitting in the stagnant air. So next slide, please. So when we look at the temperature recovery from door opening, okay, so we've covered the refrigeration system capabilities for cold wall and forced air convection system, but let's switch gears to temperature recovery from door opening. And as you, as you know, temperature recovery is key to protect the product, protecting product, and specifically for you know, long-term storage, right? So in this graph, uh, this is a standard ULT cold wall freezer. And as you can see, uh, the door was open. Uh, it was uh, on April, 20, uh, April 15th. And you can see that the temperature recovery was five hours because you see the spike. And the spike, usually a spike means when you go from minus 80 to let's say minus 72 real quick or minus 76, that's a door opening. This temperature just doesn't fluctuate that widely. And then uh, as you can see, it took uh, over anywhere from three to five hours. So we represent two door openings here from a data logging system, and it was a five hour and a three hour uh, temperature recovery. But again, it depends on the duration of the exterior, exterior door being open, and as well as how much product was added inside. So there are several vertical spikes, as you can see on this graph, and they're associated with door opening and possibly, again, warm product being added inside. But also pay attention uh, to the temperature, uh, temperature spikes as, again, they paint the bigger picture about your process in the door opening. So as most of you may have a central monitoring system, I often recommend in looking at the freezer, what we call the freezer heartbeat, right? So this is where you should see the on-off control that are clearly visible on the left side of the, of the graph here. And then, um, and, and this is, however, you should, your data logger, if it shows a flat line, uh, this is, in this case, a clear indication of a possible system failure in the near future, or possibly ice buildup on the door gasket, right? So this is where we talked, uh, mentioned in the first slides, a few slides ago, that uh, having ice buildup on the door gasket infiltrates warm air, and then the warm air causes the system to keep operating. So uh, uh, again, uh, on the system, since the refrigeration system should never operate con continuously, you know, you should probably have someone look at the system if you ever see a flat line. So temperature recovery from door opening is one of the major issue. It was one of your major concern from the poll. 
And uh, keep in mind the data shown in this slide depicts a minus 80 freezer fully loaded with products. So it's not an empty freezer, it's a fully loaded freezer. Next slide, please. So when we talk about a purpose-built freezer for long-term uh, storage, this is where the forced air refrigeration system removes the heat from the product, right? At more than six times the efficiency of a minus 80 cold wall freezer. Um, so the Ferrar minus 80 forced air convection reach-in uh, freezer is also used, uh, sorry, also uses an electronic expansion valve uh, versus, the, versus the capillary tube system that's used on cold wall freezer. So this electronic expansion valve or EEV, some of you may refer to this as a TXV or TEX valve, automatically adjusts to the flow, the flow of refrigerant based on the heat load inside the, uh, inside the chamber. So whether you place one bottle uh, into the freezer or 100 bottles into the freezer, the correct amount of refrigerant is automatically distributed to meet the freezing requirement while maintaining constant set point temperature of minus 80. So the Ferrar Forced Air Solution presented provides a wide range, con uh, wide temperature range control. So this is where, unlike a cold wall freezer, typically those are designed to operate at minus between minus 50 and minus 80. The Ferrar purpose-built freezer can operate at a wider range, minus 20 to minus 80, with full redundancy. And this is where it's key, right? So everything is redundant. We have two refrigeration system. We have two HMI controllers. We have two electrical power that power each refrigeration unit system. And um, the temperature uniformity, and this is where it's huge, right? So the uniformity within the chamber is plus or minus three degrees C at control send point with an empty chamber. So something else to keep in mind, this is the plus or minus three degrees C with no product inside the chamber. Next slide, please. So on this slide, we talk about temperature door, you know, we're talking about temperature door recovery. So on the previous slide, we mentioned the cold wall freezer taking three to five hours. But as you can see from the current slide, the temperature recovery uh, from a Ferrar ULC forced air convection system offers a much faster recovery. Uh, as you can see from a 30 second door opening, it was uh, 24 minutes. And in the middle of the graph from a a 45 second door opening, it was 29 minutes. And from a one minute door opening, uh, this was 42 minutes. And again, this is the same for either the 190 cubic foot chamber or the 311 cubic foot chamber. Empty chamber and with full door, full inner door being open. So also like to mention that the Ferrar minus 80 is equipped with a dual, what we call dual primary refrigeration system some of you may know this as a lead lag assist refrigeration system. It's a familiar term used in the industry. And just this means that uh, double the refrigeration capacity to help you pull down from ambient down to minus 80. It also offers faster temperature recovery from door opening and the freezer can maintain a control set point of minus 80, even with one refrigeration system. So the, the dual system is only for um, additional refrigeration capability, right? So therefore the forced air solution presented provides a wider range of temperature control from minus 20 to minus 80, full re redundancy, and as mentioned before, plus or minus three degrees C with an empty chamber. So the, the solution for better temp temperature uniformity and faster temperature recovery from door opening is forced air cooling, because again, the data tells the story. Next slide, please. So, so I also wanna point out the temperature mapping is one of the most important process to ensure the proper uniformity within the chamber. And most, I know most of you are aware you perform IQOQ and part of the IQOQ is to do a temperature mapping. But the one question, why temperature map an empty chamber? meaning only shelves with no racks. Well, the mapping of an empty chamber provides the worst case scenario of air temperature and uniformity within the chamber. Because as you know, the challenges of maintaining proper temperature, pro uh, product temperature is key. And in most cases, users may encounter various product load within a minus 80 freezer. And, and let me elaborate on this. So 
So example, like planning for the worst case scenario, as you scale up, is the freezer gonna be a third empty, half empty, only one shelf full of product? So the worst case scenario is always, what if I only have one two liter bottle stored inside this freezer as I'm scaling up, right? So, so this is why, you, you know, taking consideration um, your temperature mapping process. And a lot of folks will say, well, we also do a PQ, which is a perform, sorry, performance qualification. And this is where product is added for simulated load and then temperature mapping is repeated. So again, keep in mind having more product or rack within the freezer will greatly improve its temperature uniformity and temperature recovery. But imagine a freezer with only one container or a few vials, how long it takes to recover to, to control set point of minus 80. So I will now turn it over to Steve. Next slide, please. Okay, so how do you select the right ultra low temperature unit? Uh, it should start with your process requirements. What's the volume and number of containers that you need to store? And will that material be pre-frozen? Will you need limited access to individual containers, such as a few vials? Or do you need to store and ship bulk containers up to 10 liters? Is temperature flexibility useful and temperature uniformity critical? Do you need to conserve footprint and capital investment by having options on temperature ranges within the same equipment and improve reliability, reducing spares? Next slide. The chart here shows summaries of key feature features of freezing and storing materials in forced air units versus standard ULTs. Uh, the green check marks indicate the best solution. Yellow means it could meet the requirements, but it's not ideal. And red means it's really not capable of meeting that requirement. Uh, notice temperature uniformity of a standard ULT when it's trying to remove heat from material. It very likely falls outside of the acceptable ranges for some time. Unless you're freezing a very small amount of material, you will not have the cooling capacity to freeze and at the same time maintain the storage temperature in the freezer. Uh, the forced air unit includes that refrigeration capacity to freeze material while maintaining the temperature uniformity within the chamber. It can handle larger bulk containers, such as bulk bottles and bags. Um, it's a system with redundancy that allows for online service, repairs, automated defrost, which together with temperature range options can reduce the need for backup freezers. Next slide, please. Here you see two options, the ULC, 190 cubic foot chamber with the ability to roll racks into the freezer with easy floor level access and the capacity for over 500 liters of material. The ULCP 311 cubic foot chamber can store materials on pallets for easy material movement into and out of the freezer on its way to the next step in the process or distribution. Next slide. Okay, thank you so much, Stephen Sylvain. Now we have time for a few questions. As a reminder, you can type those questions in the question window. I'll read the question and our subject matter experts will do their best to answer. We've got a couple that have come in already. Okay, here's the first question. How do the new technology units um, described handle defrost? I'll go ahead and take that question, Steve and Amy. So with regards to defrost, so on the ULC or the ULCP, since it's a dual refrigeration system, 
the uh, when in, in the, the systems, the way the systems are designed, they're always in communication with each other. So let's assume the left side is operating at minus 80, maintaining the temperature. And I say minus 80, it could be anywhere from minus 20 to minus 80. Prior to going into defrost, it notifies the second system and it and lets it know that there's going to be a defrost coming in within the, or being started um, within the next, like, let's say 20 minutes. So what we do is then we start the second refrigeration system and start pre-cooling the, um, what we call the heat exchanger and the evaporator. And then so when we get into the start of the defrost, uh, so I mentioned before plus or minus three degree inside the chamber, it's actually plus or minus 1.7 degrees C temperature uniformity. But because we go into defrost, and that defrost for roughly about 42 seconds, 36 to 42 seconds, the temperature will spike up to 2.9. So as a metrologist and as a QA person, when you do your qualification, you have to take in consideration even that small spike, because if you capture it during your, your qualification and your temperature mapping, so that's why we call the unit a plus or minus three degrees. But to answer the question, it's fully automated. The system does know to switch and bring the other system in, and that's how we're able to maintain plus or minus three even the, during the defrost cycle. Okay, and, great. And as, Sylvain, as, El, as Selvin mentioned, any good uh, validation technician will require you to go through a defrost cycle on that temperature mapping. They want to make sure that um, they're challenging the worst case scenario, and that's part of it. Perfect. And speaking of temperature mapping, there are several other questions relating to that, it seems. Okay. The next one is why wouldn't you map, why wouldn't you just map a loaded chamber? Um, I can start that one. Um, so mapping a loaded chamber is something that we would do in PQ, but uh, as Sylvain mentioned in the presentation, uh, during the IOQ, uh, it's general practice to map the empty chamber because that's the worst case scenario. Uh, loaded product that's frozen inside the uh, freezer provides a bit of a, of a ballast or battery effect that keeps that uh, temperature uniform uh, within the, uh, the freezer compartment. Um, also with the empty chamber mapping, uh, what we generally find is uh, there is some location within the freezer that uh, tends to be the worst case location and, and that's the spot that we want to put our monitoring probe so that we know uh, what the temperature is in that worst case spot. Okay, great. Do the new units come equipped, the units that were described in the technology update section, do these units come equipped with temperature monitoring? So I'll take over that question. So we do offer what we call a pre predictive analytics so, uh, system, which you know we keep monitoring every aspect of the boat's refrigeration system, heat exchanger, temperature, pressure, transducer, amperage, and so on and so forth. However, um, we make, uh, so on top of the chamber, there is on the ULC and the ULCP, there are two access ports or holes for the customer to install their own BMS system, their own uh, probe in order to connect to their existing central monitoring system. And in the front of the unit, we make two, we have two um, three quarter inch opening, which is roughly, I'm gonna say like 12 millimeter in diameter uh, that are used for temperature mapping, right? So if you're still using a a system that you wanna bring in thermocouples, you never bring the thermocouples through the door gaskets, so you would feed those thermocouples through the access ports that are in the front of the unit. So we made it, I'm gonna say, very technical user-friendly. We have another question that's come in. Um, for mapping with a simulated load, is water used to simulate specimens? And if not, what is the best way to simulate a load without compromising specimen integrity? So water is generally, well, the ideal solution is, of course, to use product, but nobody wants to put their product at risk for this exercise. Um, so what's generally used is the 
formulation buffer that that material sits in without any product in it. Um, it turns out that quite often water pretty closely approximates that buffer solution. Most of the buffer is water. So um, it's not uncommon to use either water or a surrogate buffer solution. Yeah, and, and just to add to that, so when we do, and we'd be happy to provide the information, as an example, we did a test with 120 um, 10 liter bottles and then starting the unit from ambient. And let's just, we literally just pull down the temperature of every bottle down to minus 79 at the center of each bottle. So we instrumented each bottle with a, what we call like a plastic rod or Teflon rod and then placed a temperature probe at the center of the product, which was filled to 9.4 kilogram, which everybody would say, well, that's 9.4 liter, but in order to be precise, we measured every bottle. But then, so we, met, we monitor the temperature inside and also the temperature in the ambient air in order to show the uh, overall temperature uniformity of the product in the air. So obviously the air will fluctuate much quicker before the product fluctuates. Okay, thank you. Well, those were the questions that have come in today. Um, and we appreciate everyone joining our presentation today. We are going to be sending out some helpful resources and an opportunity to provide feedback on the value of the information presented and how we can work to improve. And a recording will be available on our website next week. If you have additional questions and you weren't able to include those in our um, question today for answer, it can be reached on the website as well. Just um, head to contact and you can reference this webinar there with any follow-up questions you may have. Thank you, Sylvain, and thank you, Steve, and thank you, attendees, for joining us today. Thank you all. Thank you.